this is not a place for, even though the budget committee is here, not as a quorum today, but there's no deliberation regarding this at this time. It's really informational. But because there is sometimes a quorum of the budget committee here, but that's why we notice it as a public meeting. Otherwise, we are not necessarily required to do it. And uh, we'll, we'll be moving through these pretty quick because we like to keep it on track. Um, start with the, uh, and Beth, just so you know, I know you went through this last year, right? Yes. Yeah. But, uh, it was a little hazy, though. But, uh, <laughs> I kind of <laughs> will just. Yeah. It's such a horrible experience, right? I'll kind of, I'll kind of go over your budget real quick. Um, obviously, I've already spent a good amount of time with this, but um, and point out any uh, issues if if I have any, which I don't. But I'll talk a little bit about the things that you've done in your budget, the changes that we've made. Why we're there, and then I do let the uh, while they can't deliver it, I do if they have any questions, let the budget committee members ask questions. So let me just start by saying, with the DA's budget target, not unlike all the ones we went over on Friday, we had a reduction in the general fund contribution. <coughs> Last year, the general fund budget <coughs> um, approved uh, three million eight hundred eighty-four thousand five hundred three dollars. Uh, we did the 1% CPI adjustment, which we did with each budget. So each general fund budget got a 1% increase to cover their cost. But the reduction in HERS and uh, the backing out of the previous year's CPI adjustment that we budgeted but didn't authorize uh, reduced that uh, $3.88 million to $125,859. So the general fund budget target they had was $3,000,000. $778,067, that's from $3,884,000. Uh, they actually came in under the budget target $150. And um, <laughs> so with that said, uh, pretty much a status quo budget with the exception of, you'll see from the adopted uh, FTE last year, a revised FTE of a half, a 0.5 FTE, that was a grant. Um, and then you'll see an increase in 0.5 this time. They did that within their budget target, so we didn't give them more money to do that. They did that within the amount of money you approved for their budget target. And it's, uh, while they moved some FT around in their budget, this is mostly office uh, support between the 0.5 and this additional 0.5. Um, and so I'm, with regard to the budget target and the program, fine. You'll recall last year, during the budget process that uh, Beth indicated um, they wouldn't prosecute some cases because of the reduction and I think she's implemented that mm -hmm. this year. I don't know how many we ended up. It didn't end up uh, to be near those things like I hope that we do. It's about 150 cases we didn't prosecute. So those were the kind of residue style cases if, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. So residue and baggies and pipes that are washed and then charged essentially. Um, so if you want to go over uh, a little, if, if there's something specific you want to go over, that's fine. If not, if you want to go over each of the programs or not, that's fine. As I said, it's mostly status quo. So. Um, yeah, that's fine. In our in the criminal um, division, that's where we had had the, uh, a cut last year of the position, and so we have implemented our new cartel system, which is our data management system, and we're still kind of implementing that. So that's. Um, taken longer than what we hoped for, but that should have some real cost savings as far as employees go and get that entry. So and, and you'll recall on that that we actually were able to fund that by Beth choosing to leave a position vacant until the new year, which was the one she was going to cut in under spending her budget. We didn't give an additional appropriation for that. So, um, so I think by, the, by next year, we'll hopefully see all that we can realize from that cartel back now. Our budget has continually gone down, and because of the reduction in curves that Annie talked about, that really kept us from losing another position. Otherwise, we would have definitely lost another position. I think and it was I don't the. Know if that changes again. That's going to put us in a tight spot. Yeah, I think it was the PERS. And then the other thing I mentioned this last time, but you weren't here, was um, between uh, general liability auto, you know, uh, risk funds that we carry fund balances in reserves, um, we cut, we were able to reduce indirect charges out to the department a million dollars, essentially because we were uh, uh, allocating out the cost of the actuarial 
in addition to holding the reserve. So what we thought the claims would be plus the reserve. And what we did this time is we hit the confidence level on the reserve for the actuarial. And we're now just um, building out what we think the cost would be as the indirect cost. So that reduced everybody's budget significantly cost-wise, uh, which you know freed up revenue for service delivery, in addition to the 4% reduction in payroll for PERS. And I do anticipate, I met with the chair of the PERS board and the executive director in November when we were at the LPA conference, and I do anticipate the PERS rates going back up a percent and a half to two. They were projecting four, so the, the reduction we utilized from the litigate or from the legislation was just going to be reversed in the next they do a two-year uh, rate set, but uh, it, we shouldn't see it go up that much. And I think the percent or a half or two in payroll costs, we will be able to uh, work with without significant reduction. Doesn't mean reductions, but if we can do some of the same things we did with indirect cost allocations to offset that percent and a half or two, we should be pretty pretty flat again. You have a question? So I'm, I am. Concern that, uh, like I said, we can cost it 180, and that's you mentioned. Were I don't know exactly how did you describe those kind of cases? They were drug resident cases. Okay. So if you had just a pipe that would test positive, for example, for methamphetamine, and you didn't have anything else and no other charges, then we didn't file that case. And so those people were not prosecuted. Okay. Well, where I'm going with that? So that's this time. Yeah, you just went through talking about uh, hopefully making that in the safe flat or something. With, with increase in population, how long can we do this? You said every year you know, the budget has gone down, and, and obviously everyone in each department director is going to be concerned. This concerned about their own particular budgets. We're trying to be real creative. Well, and <laughs> I appreciate we are, and I appreciate really that that's, that's a benefit the taxpayers of Jackson County. But in reality, though, how long can we do this? You know, it really will depend on the crime rates in the area, what, what kind of cases, how many volume of right. cases we're seeing. Um, I, we're, the other thing that we're kind of doing this year is our family support lawyer. So we have a, a lawyer that's just in family support that's dedicated to just doing that. And we didn't feel that that person was keep, be busy enough, was, uh, had enough stuff to do compared to our criminal lawyers. So we're giving that attorney 20% of the criminal the criminal caseload. So that's going to help a little bit again. So we, we're doing as many kind of stopgap measures as we can. And um, after we kind of settle down with the cartel system and we get some better numbers, then next year we very well may be trying to ask for another attorney position. We can Which only bit? ask people to do so much. At some sure. point, we have to stop doing something. So so far, those residue cases. If we if you had another case that that individual you know, was caught shoplifting and had a pipe, we went ahead and prosecuted the pipe case because we had the shoplifting. So what we found was that police became very creative in finding a second charge. <laughs> in, in the facts that there were, but maybe in the past they wouldn't have submitted that to us. They would have just dealt with the drug case, and now they were dealing with everything. So um, that's why that number, we were looking for more around 400 cases. So 180 was very low, because four to 500 cases were places that attorney had. And, and let me just correct one thing. Sure. The budgets haven't went down. The costs have went up. And the amount of increase we've given to each budget hasn't kept up with the increased costs. So even this year, the overall budget went down because of the reductions in PERS and the reduction in risk. But we gave a 1% increase in the budget. So and even in previous years, we've given increases in the budget target. Those increases don't keep up with the rate of growth of cost to the county. So I just want to make sure we haven't cut people's budgets. What's happened is the cost of delivering services has went up faster than the amount we funded. And my budget is trying to have personnel. Mm -hmm.
these things, do you see anything now that you've been in charge for a while, I mean, with new eyes looking at it, that we could invest in the department and make it more efficient or more productive? Uh, he means of reducing costs. Mm -hmm. uh, lower our head count and still get the job done. I mean, are there, those are the kind of things I'm most concerned um, you know, with the increase of caseloads going up and then losing people, I think that's why we've been able to just kind of stay even, not, not be asking to add more additional people with our data management system. So that helps in our support staff in the amount of data that we have to enter, we can start getting electronically. It's not fully working yet, so that's why I think next year i will have even a better picture of how much that time that saved us of employee time by getting the transfer electronically. Um, but the, the areas that I think, you know, if we were to cut back any further, the areas that would suffer is the amount of time it takes us to process a case and the things that you have to do with every criminal case, the contacts you're trying to make with the victims, meeting with them, and all those kinds of things. Those are the things that start to suffer. I mean, you're still making your court appearances, you're still doing the mechanical things you have to do, but you start kind of slacking on the support that you offer to the cases in, in general. So that's, I'm not sure that of anything that I can see so far that we could do other than the kinds of creative things we're trying to do now um, that would actually reduce our employees' reception. Yeah, right now we don't have, like we got rid of reception out of our child support. But I have three buildings, one is division. So, um, so in our buildings themselves, there is a lot of duplication. But we don't have reception in our victim services at all. You can just walk in the door and you're in the building. Um, and an employee just has to come talk to you because there's no one to intervene. Right? Other than a volunteer. And in our uh, child support division, that was a position we lost last year was reception. So they have no reception. So we only have one true reception person that's in the whole division now. Well, I was thinking uh, about the communications and things in this new building or whatever. Mm -hmm. street a lot to go get a file. Files are in one building, you have to go back and forth, and you walk back and forth between our buildings 25 times a day. <clears throat> so one of the things that other counties have done who have seen reductions far greater than what our counties experienced in support of their VA offices, and most of the counties that we compare to have seen much larger uh, prosecutor reductions mm -hmm. than we've had. Um, and also to qualify the reduction, we took a reduction of one FTE last year. It's back in the budget this year. It's one FTE. The difference is where that FTE is. It's not a prosecutor, which is what Beth's talking about dropping the cases. So we haven't technically dropped. We dropped last year, but we've already added that FTE back. What other places have done, and this is really a political kind of consequence, is they don't carry as many cases through the prosecutorial process as opposed to they do things like a rain -a rama and you know I'm, I'm going to call it blue light specials like okay you know if you'll agree to plead out then we won't prosecute you and they get cases off the docket quicker we carry cases longer because we have the luxury of having the staff to do it they were they don't carry cases longer because they don't have the luxury of having the staff to do it but that's all kind of a political balance and a you know kind of an independent choice but there are things that places have done that have reduced cost because when you're not when you're settling cases up front and you're not carrying them for months, the case lists go down, they get resolved quicker, it doesn't take up jury trial time, it doesn't take up court time, it gets people in and out of jail quicker. If they're going to jail, it gets them into the supervision system quicker or prison and back on supervision quicker. So there are things that we could choose to do, but they're they're choices. And, they're, and last year we actually lost three positions. One attorney and criminal one. But they were grant victim services, the one But they were grant funded. Not all three of those were just <laughs> victim services. Yeah. And we and I'm in well, discussions with the board. There's always going to be pressure when our 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 <clears throat> property tax taxes can only go up three percent. Mm -hmm. And you know, Danny's done a good job. 
I figured out new revenues and things, but it's thrown this out for a long period of time. But the tax charge, the costs tend to go up faster than the revenue of the general fund. And I really would say we really need to look at how these are more efficient. And that's not a criticism of what we do. And maybe more prioritizing the cases. I just don't know enough about the office to make an intelligent judgment. I think over the next five years, I'd like to see some kind of goal of cost reduction that we might be able to uh, put into it. With them, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Well, let me say, I think Beth has done a really good job dealing with what she was dealt because prior to her coming, there was, uh, I'm going to call minute incremental increases every year in support to the office. So when she first took off, she did get hit with a pretty big, and it wasn't a reduction, it just wasn't as large of an increase. As you said, the tax base is limited to about 3%, but we haven't projected a 3% growth in tax base because of the drop in property values the last several years. I mean, we were budgeting a flat growth, I think last year and the year before that, 1%. So the cost, and, and Bess office is one of those places where it happens because she has people moving through steps, is you know she'll see an incremental cost increase of 7% if she's going to carry the current service level. So when we give her a 1% budget increase, but she has 7% increase in cost, she's making cuts. They're just, you know, uh, <laughs> cuts across the arm, you know, the death by a thousand cuts kind of thing. And then she's done a good job. The other thing that kind of hit her is the, the whole uncertainty about the grant stuff, and especially the um, uh, without Violence Against Women Act uh, grant, domestic violence, the STOP grant. Stop Finance Against Women Funds. And um, so, and you know, we, you guys do have a policy, budget policy, that we won't backfill the loss of state or federal dollars. So when departments take on grants and grants programs, and they get the staff and those programs go away with them. And that's what I was talking about when you guys commented on the cuts we made. Well, there's two kinds of savings. One is productivity within the department. And the other is, is there money that we can invest in here Department that would help you become more efficient. I mean, that's the other thing. Yeah, the case management system, case management I think, was. Exactly. And those are the things that uh, I hope you're coming to us for. Yeah, the case management system was really a thing that we have been lacking for years. And so, but um, it just, as in all of these systems, takes a lot longer to implement than what we originally thought it would. Year, so we're coming up almost on a year, but it's still not fully functioning. Is it? Add a year to the most often. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> is, it to, is it to a point you have for the electronic like document uh, no. no. It's still, that Sheriff's Office is coming over partly, and IT is still working on that part. And then every police department enters the data a little differently, and so we're going to have to kind of do this fix with each department as we bring them on board. Yeah, we're integrating different local government systems ability to transfer those files electronically, which is, you know, there, there is a cost to providing discovery and public records requests, and it tends to be significant with the DA's office, obviously, because you can have case files that are that big or three or four times that big, depending on. So I, I do think they'll see some efficiencies there, and also in uh, time in spent duplication of data entry, for sure, if there supports that. I mean, in the past, like, the child support division was kind of siloed. That's all you did. It wasn't enough work so well. That's all you did. And so and that's what we're trying to change and looking at how much work she really has and saying, hey, we think we can give you 20% of what someone else does in addition to what you're already doing, and we think it'll still be okay. And that's, I think that's part of that kind of efficiency study of looking at each individual employee and saying how can we improve what they're already doing as their systems are really nice. I appreciate that. Before the Board of Commissioners is next. 
The board of commissioners uh, budget, and, and I want to I want to say this because you know I don't know that this is general common knowledge, but you know most of the board of commissioners budget is funded by chargebacks. I mean they're they're an overhead cost to everything the county does, so the general fund doesn't really spend a lot of money a good on the. Um, on the board of commissioners as well as county. Well, you hear, you know, if the commissioners just didn't make money, then they could fund this. And the truth is, you can't because it's not discretionary dollars that fund what the commissioners do, for the most part. In fiscal year 13 14, their general fund budget is $43,974. So that's all the general fund that goes into supporting the boards of board of commissioners in 13 14. Um, we made the 1% CPI adjustment to their budget. We backed out the PERS reduction. So their target was $42,659 in general fund support. They budgeted $45,219, so it came in $25,60 over. And when I say they, that's me. I budgeted. And, and uh, the difference is essentially uh, um, because of an increase in community promotions. We hadn't, in pri prior years, um, provided sponsorships and, um, uh, I'll call them do donations and awards and sponsorships. This, this board has agreed to participate in things uh, to help fund them as sponsors, and we had previously just been taking that out of unappropriated fund balance, so because they've done it multiple years, then it's, being budgeted and that that's a decision they've made each year when the request comes but each year I ask them how they want me to fund it and they want me funded in their budget so now we have an increase in line we previously used to budget about $500 and we're budgeting 3,000 this year and you can see that's right about the $2,500 that they're over the general fund target that's not something the things that they have supported by sponsorships are not something that is an indirect cost in other words you can't make you know, Health and Human Services pay for a sponsorship for something the board wants to sponsor that has nothing to do with Health and Human Services or any other dedicated fund. Um, in this budget for the Board of Commissioners, it's essentially status quo. There is no, like there is for every other department, no co uh, cost of living adjustment. And the Board of Commissioners previously have agreed to not take step increases. So for the last three years, this will be the fourth year, they wouldn't have taken a step increase. They essentially throws their salary at about 91,000, I think is what it is. Um, the, uh, there is, um, because we will have two new commissioners that will come on in January, halfway through the fiscal year, there is uh, not a big increase, but we moved money around in travel and training and accommodations to accommodate for the two new commissioners to attend the um, Commissioner College, the Association of Warwick County sponsors, as well as the normal, you know, uh, lobbying trips that they attend in D.C. that we budget for, and then participation in the Association of Warwick Counties and National Association of Counties. Uh, but there's not changes in the, um, the total amount, there's just changes in amount between those categories. And um, other than that, you know, I, there's, you, did you want to add anything, or Don or Doug? Or? <coughs> Yeah, their their overall budget, like all the other departments, is a decrease of almost thirty thousand dollars. That's the overall budget, not the general fund portion of the budget. But usually, you you know, your discretion's with the general fund in this case, as the budget committee not my review of the budget but so those are the budget targets you said and as i said the overall indirect charge outs went down for everyone as well so um, that's why you get that reduction just so 43974 on the general fund allegation um it, well that was the target but the budget budget comes in at 45219 that's because of the increase we added for the in let me just say this 
the board has decided to make that a conversation each time they get a request, but not having the money budgeted makes it difficult when they decide they want to approve it, which they have done, as I said, the last several years. And so now it's in their budget, and then they can decide whether or not, if they get the request, they want to fund it or not. And likely that'll be a decision for the new board because those requests usually come in around the first of the year. Be an example of what? Uh, let's see. Uh, the Angel, our Angel Network sponsorship. An Angel Network, Network sponsorship. Uh, Sustainable Angel. Valley Technology Group request has requested sponsorships. Um, they they approved this year a donation to the State Veterans Memorial as a sponsorship. Um, so we're talking. Funds are around fifteen hundred dollars thousand dollars. Any other questions on board's budget? As I said, since you primarily focus on the general fund, this is not a big consumer of general fund. Did you move the authority to work with the board budget? left of where they're at. <coughs> we didn't, we didn't, we will go over extension here in county administration budget. You know, so let me ask a question I'm going to ask you this, uh, this morning. Is that, uh, so if, if, if we were looking to increase dues, if a proposal was made in the <clears throat> to one of, the, one of the organizations, that come under that comes does that come under the VOCs the administration and talking about uh, for economic development? Where would what budget would that come under? Well economic development is in the county administration budget. Um, you guys have done some things that were economic development that were actually fund balance or set aside in contingency, which is part of the fiduciary. So the fiduciary also lives in county administration, but you, the budget committee decides how much you're going to put in contingency. Yeah. Okay. So is that what I thought? I, thought. I, wanted, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Two separate funds, the general fund has the general fund fiduciary and economic discussion and the central services. On 565. He, he, he. Did, did, did you get what he's saying? Well, I think so. I'm in the process. Two separate funds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, since your, most of your budget's overhead charged out, and what he's saying is since our economic development sits in a separate fund from the, the cost of the commissioner's budget. And that contingency sits over in that separate fund, separate from your central services right. budget, your overhead yeah. budget. Okay. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. The county administration has, you know, multiple programs in it. It's a, uh, including my office, but uh, audit, which the reason why they're uh, mostly associated with the general fund target is the state and federal audit requirements are third party party audit, external audit, um, and also performance audit, performance audit, performance audits with general fund departments. Um, their budget target. Uh, was 192,835. They came in at 192,749, so $86 under the budget target. Then my office, county administration, um, our budget target uh, was uh, $59,607. We came in at 55,984, so $3,600 under. And remember, this is the, essentially the same thing as the board's budget. The county administration doesn't. Uh, since the majority of our funds are dedicated funds in the county, it's charged out to dedicated funds. So the same thing applies with the cost of county administration. It's not a huge general fund uh, user. Um, another program is facility maintenance. And I think I've said this before, the county has over 100 facilities that we manage throughout the county. Uh, most people are familiar with the bigger ones, but they're spread out over you know, 2,800 square miles. 
facility maintenance uh, budget target was a uh, million fifty five thousand five hundred two, and it came in on the target. Uh, HR falls under county administration once again. Also, since they're an indirect charge, they're not a big user of general fund. But sixty five thousand four twelve was their budget target. They came in at sixty thousand six thirty four or forty seven hundred seventy dollars under the budget target. And then economic and special development. Uh, budget target there at 99,000 came in at 102, 216. That's because we had a carryover balance of $23,914 for the ta Taylor Grazing Fund. So the Taylor Grazing Fund falls under economic development in the county. The board just recently approved appointing a board or a committee to distribute those funds. This is recommendations come from that committee to the board, and then we fund projects from it, and it's dedicated funding to grazing projects. Uh, OSU extension, um, last year their, their budgeted amount was $204,204. Uh, we did make the same CPI adjustment for them that we make for everyone else. So the target was $205,225 and that's where they budgeted at. I think I explained to this to you guys when we set the budget targets in December that um, having a budget to be able to certify tax if the district passes is one important reason to have a budget. Uh, the other piece is I've proposed funding this within our existing budget based on the increase in carryover, the one-time funds, but if the district doesn't pass, the budget committee agreed that you would meet to discuss uh, your desire to continue to fund that or not, similarly to the what you decided to do with the libraries. And then the county funds uh, support to the water master's office although the water master is a state program the state funds the water master's position but we do have uh, staff that are county staff that report uh, in that office to the state water master um, their budget target was 150,360 and they came in on their budget target um, county administration you'll see well you probably won't see but overall the FTE was reduced from 34 Point two five to thirty three point one five, and that's essentially the one FTE that we moved uh, for the emergency management program to be supervised out of the sheriff's uh, budget. The funds went with that position, and then we have point one FTE of support staff that supported that one FTE. The program manager that are included in that reduction. In other words, it's a status quo FTE with moving FTE from the budget, not. Canceling MT. Um, we do have a capital projects. This is something I know you guys like to know about, so I'll just cover it real quick. Every year we we budget capital projects. Some of those are big facility style projects that the general fund supports. Some of those are dedicated funds. Um, most of them tend to be projects that hit a certain threshold for funding, so we term them capital projects when they come into the budget. Uh, in this budget, there's a little over $6 million in capital. Actually, let me get to it before I start speaking about it. There's uh, 6,444,000 in capital projects. Most of that is carryover on existing capital projects. You'll see the uh, corrections parking lot overflow, which is the parking that we're building across from the um, elections office uh, and then uh, which is 724,000 and then the health facility construction carry forwards five million of that so when you back that out we've got you know um, as I said things that qualify as capital projects but they're not building so we got some parking lot repairs we have to make at the animal control facility we have masonry maintenance on the courthouse here that we need to do a jail generator transfer switch that we have to replace. We have the Justice Building boilers and controls. We need to replace the roof in the Justice Building. Um, Justice Court, we've talked a little bit about this in the budget targets, but we are going to need to acquire a facility either by building one or um, remodeling one for our Justice Court. And so we've budgeted for architectural services for that either by designing one or remodeling, uh, designing a remodel. Uh, the Medford Libraries needs the roof sealed on the lower section. We have uh, some parking lot issues over at the Moore Center, uh, 
which is our detox facility, and then uh, surplus building, exterior wall siding replacement, so the siding's rotted out and we need to replace it. Um, so as I said, most of those are non-critical. We did not budget, um, we budgeted the architectural, architectural services, but we didn't obviously budget a capital project for the Justice Building because we don't know if we're gonna buy an existing building or actually you know, do a capital project. Um, we're still searching for property in the building. Yeah, our, our lease is up in, in January the 16th, so we got to get moving. And if we can, if we can build one, um, it would cost effective for us. At least where we are is pretty steady. Yeah, you look, you have to have a question. Welcome, Max. I'm oh, just wondering um, the architectural services for the DA's building, is that coming in the next? I thought we, we were looking at it in this next budget cycle, but we're going to fall in budget. I didn't budget anything for the DA's facility, but the Board of Commissioners is going to have a discussion about that um, and then bring it to the Budget Committee. But that hasn't happened yet. We're going to schedule it. And so there is nothing budgeted for architectural property acquisition, although the idea is to build on the property we currently have or a capital project. Um, and, you know, I assume that we've determined a revenue source, as I said, from our property sell for the Justice uh, Court building, that we'll be able to turn the revenue over. We won't need to likely do a supplemental budget if the board, if we either acquire an existing property or build a property because we'll be carrying a rainy day fund balance that we'll have some appropriation authority from. Then the revenue we get will just be built back the fund balance. Um, so I think that kind of answered your questions. Yeah, yeah. I know that you usually ask some questions about capital projects, so if you, if you do, I don't mind. Um, on the building you're building down here for a company and services, mm -hmm. that's two-story, right? Yes. And did you say that's capable of adding another story? Or two or no. no. When we first built it, I approached the state about partnering with us. Um, I actually put a financing package together with them to do it through either the county would take um, uh, through revenue bonds. The county would take essentially borrow the money, build the uh, repayment of interest and the bond um, back into the lease they paid. That was for the building and parking. They thought that was too expensive for them to afford. So then I approached them about issuing their own debt through certificates of participation, they're called at the state, their type of debt financing that only the state has, the county doesn't, but they can get a much lower rate. And we cut the cost back almost $16 million over the term of the lease by doing that. But they just decided they couldn't move quick enough and they couldn't couldn't uh, indebt themselves uh, to do it. So we proceeded with just the county doing it. Now what we're doing is the county put in a portion of general fund contribution to the building so that we own the property in the building and then we're leasing the building back to the department. So we're going to convert dedicated funds to general fund through lease payments um, essentially and you know we're looking probably at a, a million to a million and a half or more per year. We, we're, we're determining what those rates are going to be right now. Those will be reflected as an expense to the dedicated funds in the human services budget. But essentially the reason why we put our money into it was so that we would have a long-term uh, discretionary revenue that we didn't have before. And what do we do with the revenue? It gets deposited in the general fund and then you guys decide how you want to spend it. If you want to save it or spend it or do whatever you want to do with it. <coughs> It's one of those things that goes along with the $1.2 in gel bed rentals that we created, and this is another million and a half or so in lease payments, so there's $3 million in new revenue to the general fund we didn't have before per year. So we haven't dedicated that revenue yet? No, we haven't began receiving it yet. Well, I know, but I just say we haven't made a decision. <clears throat> well, you haven't made a decision, but the discussion was there's been multiple discussions, but the main point out of the discussions was we currently allocate an appropriation of general fund to human services for county required services, and what we're kind of hoping is we'll be able to convert that dedicated fund into the money that we give them back for the services that they're doing for us right now to come out of the general fund, and that'll free up that amount in the general fund. 
so they, they run our general medical program. They run, manage the service partner grants. Those are all non-dedicated service elements that they deliver that are general fund expenses. We give them money to do that. And before we couldn't convert dedicated funds back, but now we've done it through a lease agreement. And you, but you don't have to spend it on that, but you're giving them the money anyway. So you know, you can do it. You, you, it's your discretion. It's discretionary revenue. But it used to be dedicated revenue. Innovation at its very best. <laughs> um, again, why, why did we limit the building a two-story? Well, because we didn't, we, we only had a certain amount of money, and we, we bought what we could afford. Um, you can look at that building, and then you can drive down the street and look at the PRS building and know that we didn't build the Taj Mahal. We built, you know, uh, general governmental office building. I was worried about it seems like health and human services tends to grow. Yeah, and it's it's gonna be outgrown yeah. the day we open that building. But we said that when we began. So when we when we when we first came in uh, this current quarter, two or three, uh, there was a long discussion about that, <clears throat> and there was you know there was debate back and forth whether we even wanted to recommend going forward building a new building. And uh, it, Danny, it's exactly right. Because at that time, too, the Affordable Care Act was uh, a gleam in someone's eye. So we had no idea that uh, the additional burden, we know it's going to be incremental growth, but not uh, exponential. exponential growth. Thank you. So uh, we exactly right. We, we had X amount of money we figured with that we would, could approve. So that's, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then, you know, in hindsight, would have been said, yeah, we could have spent a little more money there. Get greater return into the future. At the time, you know, it's like a lot of budget decisions. You'd like to, to build for the future if you can, but if you can't afford it, you have to build for what you need to do. So. We, we did bring a couple recommendations to expand the size, and it was a discussion. The board decided not to do it. And then they decided to actually expand within the two floor we footprint, did, yeah. and they agreed to that ultimately. So we added, was it 11,000? We added 11,000 square feet from the original design. But you know, the footings have to be heavier for a third yeah. story. The, the structural steel has to be. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot more cost to even pre-design the third floor. And then what happens? This has happened in every county I've worked in. Is you pre-design all that, and then the earthquake standards change, and then when you go to build it, you got to go back and retrofit it. Anyway. So jails are perfect example. Yeah, the jail here was designed originally to go up under you know in the 80s, 81, I think, and the standards have changed. So even though it was designed for it. And you spent all the money at the time, you can't build it now unless you go back and retrofit it for today's size. We did police cars off the other end of the property to build the building there. We did, we did, we did size the footings and the structure because there wasn't additional structural capacity because it is still built for adding floors and parking. So we do have the capacity to go up and parking. We're going to need that capacity because, as I said, we went from serving. 19,000 people to 50,500 so far on Oregon Health Plan in our county. So does that mean we're not going to move out of the East Main buildings? No, we're going to move out of the East Main buildings. We're going to hold portions of those buildings. Um, environmental health, which the public doesn't access, it's not, it's, they're out at restaurants and, and pools. and So we're going to operate environmental health out of there so there's no public access. Mm -hmm. And we're also talking about um, doing veterans out of there because there isn't multiple floors and you know, lots of areas to move. But we're only talking on the admin side of the property. The south side of East Main. Okay. South side of East Main. Okay. We're working with a property company right now. As I said, we do have the opportunity to develop a revenue from leasing those properties. That was all part of the ROI. Or we can sell them outright. So we're, <coughs> we're going through and making an assessment. Is it worth the investment to upgrade them or part of them or sell part of them or lease part of them? And we're three quarters of the way through that. Those won't be numbers that are reflected here. There'll be things that we'll adopt, but they'll, that'll create another discretionary revenue. So that's that old metric plan. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The series of three All, buildings. Yeah. Four or five of them. The doctors are on the other side. Right? Well, so yeah. well, we have administration over there right now, but we're, yeah. as I said, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're not sure, you know, when we built this building, we were supposed to only have 37,000 mm -hmm. on working on 
we have 50,500, we're uh, expecting 52,000 by the end of this calendar year. So, and we're, as I said, just to clarify, we don't serve all those 52,000 people. We're serving 11, we have an 11% penetration rate. So we're gonna serve 5,500 people where we used to serve 2,000 people. And when we built this building, we expected about 26, 2,700 people. So it's twice what we expected. And that is simply attributable to the Affordable Care Act. Oregon's version of it. Right, yeah, I think it, and that's the other reason, you know, I think it will get scaled back because, and, and so Dick, with regard to those facilities in April, um, you know, when it's scaled back, we'll have additional capacity, but we are also partnering with, you know, private nonprofits essentially, like with, with Clinica and um, some of the drug and alcohol providers. Who are also leasing space from that building to generate the same discretionary revenue? Mean, they do that to the department. We're just building the department at the flat rate, and they're able to go back and, and recover some of those costs. It creates service enhancements. For example, people that might have came to public health, you know, that could also come in and be case managed under the Affordable Care Act, Oregon's version of the coordinated care organizations with uh, physical, dental, and mental health, and they have a, a home, a medical home can get their medical home right of the clinic rather than just coming in and, and seeing the county public health uh, officials. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. But as that waiver the, the state received from the federal government, which was essentially going to cover three years of implementation, expires, the idea was the state would have enough savings to cover that amount of money, which probably isn't going to happen. So they'll tier plan like they've done in the past and they'll cut people's back in levels of benefits and, and stages of benefits. And then, then we'll see more room, right? So that's the other thing that the commissioners discussed was they didn't want to overbuild it and have buildings sitting partially vacant. All right. Any other questions on yeah. that? Yeah. Where is this money, the six million four four four? All of it is essentially dedicated funds except for 600000 of it. It's a general fund. And usually, typically, what covers these costs that we don't budget as a revenue to the general fund are interest earnings because we use them for capital projects. So for the general fund portion, uh, you heard Shannon, I think, say our portfolio is about $130 million. We'll earn a percent and a half. We're going to spend 600 that million. We'll earn a percent and a half on that 130 million. 50 percent of that about goes to dedicated funds. 50 percent of it goes to giving you rough numbers. It goes to the general fund. We'll take that portion of general fund. It will build our fund balance because obviously 50 50 percent of one and a half percent of 130 million is going to be more than 600 grand. But we're going to spend part of it on capital projects, and that's usually where it comes from. Mm -hmm. Are you dealing with six million? Is the five? The five is a big number. Still come out of the health. That's health support. Part of that's part of that general fund is carryover from. It's our in the fund this year. No carryover is part of the in the fund balance next year. This isn't six million in new. It's six million what we were doing this year plus what we're going to do next year. Yeah. And most of it as a cash item that the money gets to reserve, it wouldn't show until it's spent. <coughs> Well, we use an accrual it's method, but yeah, it's a cash it's, item, you're right. It's but already expended, so it'll already post as an expenditure against this fiscal year. Well, I should never ask the question when I get mixed up in those funds. No, you're, you're right. On a cash basis, you're right, but we are a modified accrual basis, so we do expense it. In your business, you're, you, you were a cash basis, so. You, it would happen that way in, in your business and ours, we've already done it. And now we're gonna take that expense and that revenue and move it forward. And we'll actually pay the bills as they come due, but yeah. we account for it at the time we accrue it. <clears throat> as it's been posted as an expenditure in the Health and Human Services Fund and the General Fund, hasn't been posted as an expenditure in the Capital Fund. Not until we pay something. Accounts at one time. Mm -hmm. Were you a private accountant at one time? How did you ever make the 
It was a long, slow you, you guys, I'm going to move on to community justice because we're getting It's almost like you've got to start there. Community justice. Okay. I have one question. As these title screen funds are becoming a little bit sketchy, so how do you see that transition going from the title screen funds? Do you see it moving into the general fund, or how do you see that happening? Well, Title III is carrying you know, in our budget, and right now you have two years worth of uh, obligation from existing funds in the new Title III. Under the old Title III, which was Public Law 106-393, where it was more discretionary, uh -huh. we're spinning that down. Most of that goes to public safety and most of that goes to search and rescue because that's a function that it could support. And when that's gone, they're going to have to make reductions in those operating costs or find other revenues or the general fund's going to have to support. Tracy. Yeah. Tracy. No, we cut that already out of there. Oh, um, hi guys. Yeah. I'm not sure if everybody knows this is uh, Shane Dingy and Cricket. Uh, they're with uh, Community Justice. And uh, Community Justice is also is a fairly large consumer of general fund. Um, their current year budgeted uh, general fund contribution was six million fifty one thousand seven hundred sixty three dollars. We gave up, provided the one percent CPI adjustment. We backed out the PERS reductions and the reductions in RIT are uh, uh, backed out the <coughs> CPI that we budgeted but didn't authorize last year. Uh, so um, their budget target this year was moved down to five million four hundred fifty four four hundred fifty six thousand. Um, and this budget represents five point eight. Seven eight million, which is over the budget target, but that's because there's a carryover of dedicated funds, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, I'll, before I get into their <coughs> IT and that kind of stuff, I want to kind of just refresh because the sheriff's budget and these budgets, this budget, um, work very pretty dependently on each other because community justice from the dedicated funds we receive from the state does fund a significant portion of the sheriff's budget, not this general fund budget target. Um, but you'll recall in the sheriff's budget discussion, I talked about generating the 1.2 million in revenue from the jail bed leases, not funding the positions, plus generating a net revenue to the general fund. In Shane's community justice's budgets, budget last year, you you authorized a $1 million increase in general fund support, and you did that because we didn't want to, have to close the transition center. But we did it under the assumption that since the state budget wasn't set yet, we had projected that we would actually receive more than we were budgeting for, but we were budgeting based on the governor's budget at the time, and we had to wait for the legislature to do their work. So essentially what happened was the legislature did come in. I called them incentive funds um, back then. That's not what they ended up terming them, their um, reentry or reinvestment funds. They did come back and authorize us about $844,000 in the biennium, so $422,000 a year. What I asked community justice to do based on that was to underspend in the current year that we're in right now, their general fund budget target by $500,000 roughly, um, use that four hundred twenty two dollars to offset that other portion of the million, and then carry half of that, which is another four hundred twenty two thousand dollars into next year to use in their budget, the budget we're here to talk about today. So what's going to happen in their budget is they're going to underspend their general fund budget target this year around a half million dollars. Um, I say around because, you know, we haven't pinned down the projections yet, which it's not time for me to do that. I'll, we'll have those projected for you by the time we get to your budget hearings. Um, and then they'll carry over this 422. We were able then to reduce their budget target by half a million for next year. So hopefully that makes sense to you. We didn't get rid of the whole million dollar increase that you gave them. We got rid of half of it, but we're also going to get underspent this year by half a million. So it, it really does cover that one year, but it does it over two years. Um, now what's not represented in this budget, which I talked about the other day, those reinvestment funds, what we decided to do with those was to open up a program in the jail beds the sheriff is renting a portion of those jail beds that's generating 1.2 million. 
and Shane has been negotiating with multiple counties to have them rent space in our jail for people to participate in the program. We will still net additional capacity to our county, which is great, but we'll also net the revenue to both the Sheriff's Department and the Community Justice Department budget. This budget doesn't reflect those revenues yet because we haven't entered into those agreements and we don't put things that we don't have agreements for in terms of revenue into the budget. So we'll likely come back and do a supplemental budget. Um, let's see, how many? I'm trying to remember, we have nine. Uh, is there about 10, roughly 10 beds we're talking about? Probably close to 19, 12, maybe 13. Okay. So, you know, we're talking. Seven eight hundred thousand dollar reduction in general fund once we get that up and going. So what will happen is next year, when we get that revenue that's not budgeted, instead of coming in and getting appropriation authority for it, we'll ask them to underspend the general fund again, and that should cover the whole million dollar increase and actually net a reduction in future operating expenses to their budget from the general fund. Um, for uh, Actually, since that was a lot, do you guys have any questions about part of that before I go on? I'm not sure. You're talking about this 400. So, if you look across the line on their budget, um, you'll see the the third column it says adjustments. We reduced their budget five hundred thousand dollars of the million you gave them from the current year that we're in to next year. Plus, we reduced it by the PERS reductions. Okay, so that got their budget target down from six million fifty-one to five million four fifty-six. So we just backed out half a million of the million you increased their budget. Moving into next year for the general fund, just for the general fund. The reason why we're able to do that is because they received in the current year four hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars. Okay, that they're going to use to offset that roughly. I'm saying roughly because I haven't projected the balances yet. Um, and they, they actually received 844000 but that's for two years from the state because the state funds in biennial cycles. We're using half of it this year, and we're going to use the other half next year. That $422,000 offset what we did to the general fund, but because we received that, the, the, that money, and we're going to create the program in the jail, we anticipate on generating a revenue of between half a million and 700000 a year. That then the year after will reduce their general fund by again. Now, now do you follow it? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. Were there other questions on that? Don, you would like you. No, I'll answer this. That's it. Makes sense. <laughs> Usually I pick up on these things pretty quickly, but I You'll do in, alert here. In community justice's budget you will see from the thirteen fourteen uh, budget to fourteen fifteen no uh, increase from the revised budget, but a one person increase from the adopted budget, and that's because they actually received a grant for domestic domestic violence. I think it was, was it the STOP grant too, or the VAWA grant? So it was the Violence Against Women Act grant, which that was one they had cut the position because at the time we did the budget, they didn't know they were going to receive it, and then they added it back after they received notice that they were going to receive it. And other than that, it's mostly status quo with the total FTE, but they have moved some things around who's responsible for what within each program. Um, and, you know, frankly, this is a little bit, and this might be why you did rub the skin off your forehead, Dick, this is a little bit of a moving target because this is not a budget who's <laughs> mostly dependent on just general fund. We're also dealing with the state legislature who keeps moving the target. And they move the target not just in the things I just talked about, jail beds and um, that's in the adult supervision program, but they moved the target with regard to the juvenile portion of the budget as well. So juvenile crime prevention dollars um, were a big legislative issue this special session. They wanted to move the funding stream to the youth, uh, YCF youth, uh, yeah, the state, the youth authority, um, and 
They wanted to take funding that was for prevention, that we have proven outcomes that work in juvenile crime prevention, and move it to education and do prevention in education rather than do prevention in public safety. Um, they decided not to do that. Didn't go through. And uh, so, you know, this, this budget, like human services, is always a moving target because it's primarily a service we deliver with the exception of the juvenile portion. So the Talent Transition Center and the adult supervision programs in their budget are funded from mostly from the state. Well, essentially all from the state. And then the county funds the juvenile portion because the juvenile services are county mandate. Not all the services we deliver, that's why we receive funds from the state uh, via the uh, juvenile crime prevention plan. We also receive what's called behavior rehabilitation services grants that go to fund dependent and delinquent youth who are in the, in the facility for placement or treatment there. And that's also essentially a state pass-through funded mecha uh, uh, state mechanism that passes, uh, funds it as a state pass-through. Um, I think that's, I, you know, besides saying that I'm fine with the budget and, and I'm hoping that you're realizing here this is a half million dollar reduction in the general fund with a revenue in the next year coming in of a half million to roughly three quarters of a million, which is where we wanted to get them. And we did that without a service cut, either to the sheriff or to community justice. So uh, 1.2 million turnaround over the two budget cycles and the sheriff 1.2 million in revenue from jail bed rentals. So a, a pretty good swing, not additional uh, taxes or tax money to do it, um, but building capacity in our jail that's much needed, even though some of it's made up by having to create the funding mechanism to have the part that will be available to our county. I mean, in a perfect world, if we could afford to do it in the general fund, we would make all 60 beds available and not rent out the beds, but, you know, the concept was for us to use it to generate the revenue to be able to fund some additional capacity for it. One more thing I want to say about that is community justice has worked very thoroughly with the sheriff's office the last six months or so to develop the release program in the jail where you were seeing a significant issue with jail capacity. Um, they've implemented that <coughs> program now, and actually they're under capacity in the jail right now as, they, as they're working to implement it. So we're not kicking people out the front door, back door like we were before. And it's, you know, it's going to take a while to clean up because you have a lot of people that have failed to appear that have to come through that system and get booked and matrixed and all that kind of stuff. But once that happens, then we should uh, be able to manage the capacity better. What a lot of people don't know is the reason why our capacity was affected wasn't necessarily because of a whole rise in crime rate here or a misuse of jail by um, sanctions or the courts, but it was because the state cut out of the state court system the pretrial release program. And they were releasing, they had two, uh, two FTE that were releasing about 500 people a month. So they were releasing each. 500 people each. They were releasing 1,000 people on their own recognizance through the court pretrial release program, and they cut that program, and it put all the burden of those people on the jail. So it's a, it's a system that we don't control, but that affects the input of the system we do control. Um, and so this matrix system is partially meant to compensate for that, so evaluate people who should be released on their own recognizance rather than sitting in, that used to be a decision made by the court, that is a decision by law that's forced upon the sheriff when he hits overcrowding. So, and then Shane, is there anything you want to say specifically about the programs or anything that I didn't? Yeah, just, to, I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, the part that um, Dave's talking about with the coordination with the jail and the sheriff's office, it's, uh, um, I'm really excited about that program and how it's worked out so far. We've been trying to implement that matrix piece that Dave's talking about for several years and it's just finally came together where the right people were in the right places, and we were able to put that in, in run. And I really liked the fact that I told them probably maybe two months before they started to see that impact really take place, but that after two weeks, we were already seeing the movement and trained all their deputies and um, to do the program, and also um, made it a real strong effort to make sure the management was supported it from the top down. And, uh, it's, it's made a big difference already. I think we're going to see some, some changes. 
and the kind of people that are being held in jail. And I think we'll also see some um, beds being open so it's not constantly at capacity. And the other piece of that is along besides just the financial is the, um, the value that the program that we're putting in the, um, to the pod at down the jail, the um, rehabilitation project, that's going to have a huge effect on our ability to control some of the drug and alcohol problems and address that from not just a financial matter, but also just from a, from a criminal standpoint. And so I'm pretty excited about both of those programs. I'm just going <clears> to <throat> say that uh, this is just another example here, seeing how the human services and Machine and department heads are working with Danny administration and such. It, it, I, it's, it's, and for the candidates who are running, I think they'll find this as well. And, uh, but one of my the, probably the best, uh, biggest uh, gratifications of being in this office is seeing how well and how innovative county staff at all levels operate. I mean, you go to another county, and uh, not that we're the only ones that think like this or these folks here, but uh, I think you'll find a lot of programs that run here. Mm -hmm. Hadn't even been thought about in other areas. And that's one reason we've been able to uh, continue to keep our head more than above water. <coughs> I, just, I, I want to take the opportunity again to just congratulate uh, everyone that's involved. Because this isn't the only example, but it's a great example. So, Danny, am I right in that the general fund portion of how this budget is maybe like 30 or 40 percent of the budget? total funds, because there's dedicated funds for specific programs. And, and is that, is that yeah, I mean, understanding on my Generally part? speaking, I would say, you know, you got three business unit, three programs. Yeah. You could split them out 33% generally. They don't balance exactly at 30% each. But the, the general fund portion goes to juvenile. Mm -hmm. You guys kicked in a little bit to the transition center, so that doesn't hold exactly true. Right. But the benefit for the general fund doing that was the jail space and the issue of having an alternative to incarceration in the jail for people rather than just letting them loose on the street. And right. it's a huge impact to the sheriff's ability to manage the jail to have the transition center uh, available way more than the million dollars that we you know, kicked in. I mean, when we were renting jail beds outside of the county, uh, we were spending a million dollars on you know, a third of the capacity we have out there. Right. So we were spending two million on it half the capacity they have out there. So, so it's been much less expensive to do it that way. So so Mark Orndorff does this nice spreadsheet for us, a nice big spreadsheet. It gives us this more visual picture of where general fund dollars go versus dedicated funds. I don't know, I personally find that very helpful, getting that more visual perspective. And, you know, I think your budget is complicated enough that it would certainly mm -hmm. help me to see we, we could see it that. in that perspective. I think that would be very helpful to, you know, all the ins and outs that, that are going on here. Yeah. We, we could do that, Craig. Yeah. But, but do let me say, there are three programs. Yeah, I know. Marks, I, I know. 13. It's not anywhere near as complex. And so the I reason why we did it with Marks, and so what I'm telling you is, yeah, we could do that. But also, so you know, when, when we bring you the appropriation orders, you know, it says the amount by program that the general fund supports in their appropriation. Uh, and so the same thing with the sheriff's office. It, how it says it, it gives you the total budget and then all revenues, and then the difference in the balance is how much the general fund is. So if there's three programs, we could put that in a spreadsheet, but I'm just saying we could also, it's harder to do it through 13 programs with Mark than there is with three. Yeah. But we can do that. I mean, it's not a big deal. So it might help. It help me. Most of it, typically, you know, when I when I did the program, what I the, the county was putting, I think, three, Three million, maybe two, two million in general fund into the adult side, and what I said was, hey, we can cut that out, county can stop. We'll figure out how to fund it, and we did. You know, we moved all the general fund out of the adult programs and just into juvenile. So that's really the model we want to be at. Um, we choose to have additional services here that help reduce the county's expenses, and you know, like the transition center. When you look at a per cost day and per bed per day cost for a jail bed. The statewide average is $120 per day per inmate. You look at the transition center, you're talking about $65 per day. So if we can put them in a less expensive form, less restrictive, that allows them to go to work and allow, and you know, and it helps pay for the program, it's less expensive for the county to invest in that than it is to invest in jail. Of course. 
I think it's fine chain too. The, the, it's it's outcome based, evidence based mm -hmm. results. So I mean that's so it's a win win. Yeah, it's not just saving money. Right. Right. I mean, it's right. actually having having good results. Right. So. And that's what, that's what a lot of the people sometimes forget as we go into this. We're trying to make a difference in the recidivism rates and the crime rates in our community, make it a little place to you know bring your families and vacation and everything else with it. So it's we all, it always comes down to the dollars. But I think we're providing a lot of service in Jackson County the, the way we do things. I, I have a chance to see the other counties and how some of them operate. And we're one of the only ones left. Us and one other have a transition center left that haven't had to cut it all out. And uh, it's a huge asset to us. Could you uh, talk a little bit about the juvenile center uh, or just running full capacity? Or, uh, what capacity? Mm -hmm. and how effective are you? Uh, you know, just a little conversation about mm -hmm. how we're spending our money there. The juvenile departments, um, it's about 75% ran by general fund, and the other parts are just funding streams that come in from different grants and, um, and other programs. The, um, the capacity, we're right now, we've had, and we're not sure exactly why the phenomena are, but we've had a less number of juvenile offenders in uh, detention than we have in the past. We've both numbers have brought down. So we are not running the full capacity. We could if we needed to, but we've, um, and some of that is that's the way we handle some of the caseloads in there. We're working with the kids and their families a lot more, so they're less time locked up, and we don't always push for the POs to just lock them up when there's a problem. Try to work through with the, um, with the courts and, um, and get, find out what the source of it is, maybe hit them at that level. And I think that philosophy works a lot better, especially with the kids. Um, we do the, um, the treatment aspect of it in there as well, so we're going through all the treatment programs and, we cover all that with um, depending on what their needs are. But right now, um, we're probably we're able to rent some beds out. We've been a couple to Josephine County, and we also um, of course the beds if they need one they have there rent that too. But I said not running at capacity, but able to do a lot more programming. Speaking of that, is there any opportunity to rent beds out, to more beds out for some of the counties? We are trying definitely. It, it's, it's open in that the ones that we're, we're seeing right now is a big push from the state to regionalize most stuff. We've seen a lot more push on that, so um, we've actively been doing some of that with the adult and the juvenile side. And, and being the largest population center in the southern region that, that we represent, um, a lot of them don't want to come to us for those kind of services. And naturally, um, you know, we can we can supply that. I'm going to go ahead and get going on the uh, surveyors okay. review yeah. here real quick. As everyone knows, Scott. Okay. I think. Uh, we got a good introduction to Scott in the last, uh, a lot of things he's done since the last budget process and the last budget process. You know that he essentially took some pretty uh, drastic action to cut back the surveyor's office um, last budget cycle. He's continued to do a lot of things in his department, uh, automate a lot of things, provide access to the people. He created a subscription service for the title companies done some things to generate some revenue. His budget um, is not a status quo budget, but what I want to talk about a little bit is the barriers that he's faced in being essentially a dedicated fund for the most part with the funding mechanisms in his department. So he has the Corner Preservation Fund. For those of you that are here, you'll remember that a lot of the activities were being done in that fund because that's where the revenue was. Prior to Scott coming, and actually prior to the previous uh, county surveyor, Kerry uh, Bradshaw, we had an issue where the fund had in a uh, properly expended general or core fund dollars where it should have been a uh, discretionary fund expense. And so the budget committee, I essentially recommended you approve I think it was around three hundred thousand, ended up being two hundred thirty thousand dollars to pay back the corner fund. And as I said, that wasn't Scott, and actually, it wasn't his predecessor either. It was the predecessor to that. Um, and we did that. We then set up his uh, budget in two uh, business units, essentially a corner side and an office side. That's helped them manage how they assign costs. The problem is a lot of the overhead costs and carrying staff to serve the public that comes in the front door that have activities that aren't corner fund related. They're related to questions about plats and subdivisions and 
surveys um, that he doesn't have a way to generate revenue for. So we've talked a lot this year about ways to help him generate revenue. And one of the things that we did, and you'll see this reflected as I discuss here the FTE, he's went from three FTE in last year's budget to five recommended in this budget. What we did is we had a retirement of an engineer, it wasn't a surveyor, right, in Rhodes? Was it a surveyor? Okay. Of a surveyor in Rhodes, and as opposed to having the Rhodes Department refill that with an FTE, we sat down and had a discussion about having them contract with the surveyor's office to provide some of that work for them. So they split the cost between what would be dedicated to the road fund and what would be contracted for services to the road fund. And that brought a significant revenue to the surveyor's office to be able to add staff capacity that will help serve the general public for those things that he's not able to generate a revenue for and can't use the corner fund for. So we're looking at how do we get discretionary dollars in his fund. And then also, um, we similarly did a project with the airport where we agreed there's a ton of survey work at the airport, so sit down with Burn Case and Scott and uh, agreed to have a, essentially a, an MOU, inter interdepartmental agreement for the surveyor's office to do ongoing incremental work at the uh, airport. It's not a specified service level, it's discretionary service level, but it's at Scott's discretion, so he's allowed to do as much of it as he can or as little as he needs to. So that leaves him the opportunity for his staff to do the work with uh, subdivisions, plats, um, surveys, survey work not specific to the corner preservation fund, and other things. Um, but we, we still have an issue with not having enough discretionary dollars for that office side of the work. So we've looked at, and this is I think what you were referencing there, April, we've looked at, um, creating uh, opportunities for him to be able to fund those things and what we're looking at right now is going through legal counsel so we've asked legal counsel to give us a lot of information about what we could do and what we can't do we've posed them with some questions on ideas that we have and we're gonna continue to do that that's not represented in this budget but those are things that are going to change between now and when you meet and even after we adopt the budget uh, hopefully so there is an increase in FTE. Those increase is attributable to the increased workload for those contracts. What he was able to do is use his existing staff to serve those contracts and use the difference between what those existing staff cost and front counter staff, which are less expensive than surveyors, and bill at the surveyor rate for the work and then use the cost difference to fund the office staff at the front. So we bought less expensive staff with the more expensive staff work at the higher rate of uh, revenue generation for the contracts that we have with roads <coughs> and the airport. Uh, Scott's also done a lot of work and we direct work for property management and surveys that the county needs in general. So mm -hmm. um, we're doing everything we can from the discretionary side of the revenue so far. Well, maybe not everything. We're still looking at options, but a lot to help him be able to do that. And that's in lieu of, you know, really just having to flat out increase his fees to the public. So we're trying to figure out ways to not have to just go out every year and increase fees. Um, other than that, I mean, his two programs essentially are the two programs. Um, besides those additions that we made in those reasons, it's pretty much a status quo budget. We do expect an increase in the number of subdivisions and plats being filed and reviewed by his office because we've seen the increase in development services and recording, and as I said, survey, recording, development services, and the assessor are the ones that are affected mostly by the pickup in the economy when we're dealing with construction and loans and banking and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's a good thing, except for that increment of cost difference we're not covering is a problem when more people are coming in the front door and we don't have a way to recover the time that staff spend with those people because Scott's fund is a dedicated fund. He's not a general fund uh, department. So he's not supported whatsoever by the general fund. And that's because of the corner preservation uh, 
fun bounce. You guys at one point had talked about, uh, I think that fun, is it about 1.2 million in this budget? Do you remember the fun <coughs> bounce? Um, it was about <coughs> million. So you saw that corner preservation fund think sink down to about $750,000 budget before. You had asked me if there was a way with the previous surveyor to kind of put a lid on that. And I essentially said we could set it up as an unappropriated ending fund balance and then he wouldn't have the authority to spend it. Um, we did, ultimately decided against that as long as the surveyor was kind of working close with us to make sure that we were keeping our lid on it. And Scott essentially has you know moved the work out of the corner fund because he just didn't want to spend money that we had just to spend it. And so that's building the fund balance there. The problem is everyone says, well, you got all this money in the corner fund, but we can't use it for the things that are the problem uh, financially in his office, the discretionary side of the uh, business units. So um, anything you want to add to that, Scott? Your logic about moving the stuff and roads and the airport makes sense, except that we could get it done cheaper than the contract. Well, let me. How, how do you handle that? Yeah, okay. He, Scott is cheaper typically than what the market costs right now. So, but the departments aren't required to work with Scott. And I've told Scott, you have to be competitive because they're not just going to work with you because you need money. They're going to work with you because you need money and you're competitive. So he's uh, beating the market rate, and his intention is to continue to do that. This is typically not something that's required by local contract review board rules to be bid because it's a professional service. So we don't we're not required to go bid it. We're allowed to hire whoever we want. But I don't at all in any way whatsoever direct the department just to spend money because you know Scott needs it. Scott has to be competitive, and that's how we're managing that. So if I ask the roads guy who's coming in. Your guy retired, it cost you so much to do survey or work. Assuming you're getting all the work done you want to get done, is that cheaper than hiring another replacement surveyor and or contracting and work out? He'll say, yeah. I, I, I think he will. Uh, however, let me say it's only been <laughs> about three, three months. So no, I, we only have three months of experience. I so. understand. I'm just putting that as a question maybe a year from now. Yeah, I mean, yes, I think he would say it's less expensive. It is obviously less expensive for us to not carry an FTE in a department where we can get a contract at a rate. However, he's carrying the FTE in his department, but he was already carrying the FTE. So what he's doing is using the capacity within those staff level positions that are the high cost positions to fill a niche, essentially, of uh, what these departments need, and then hiring in the, the lower level staff that help serve the public and you know the front counter um, staff. But Dick, I got to tell you, I mean that's a con constant, ongoing evaluation. It's not just a one-time answer. In other words, we would have an outside contractor do the work. We have, in some cases, ordinances where the county surveyor has to review that work on the county's behalf. And when he's doing the work, then he is reviewing it at the same time. So the, the department needs to be billed for hiring the outside surveyor and billed for the time that the surveyor, you know, the, the county surveyor, had to spend on it. And that eliminated that expense to the department. Well, if 
figured you looked at it. We are going to continue to look at it. We've been working pretty hard to try to make sure that Scott has what he needs to be able to run his department, and he's doing a great job. Yeah, but it is lean, and it's lean because of the, you know, it's the same thing. We have huge fund balances in our dedicated funds, but we can't take it and spend it certain places. He has the same problem. Any other questions? You got any other comments? I would say just a on a day-to-day, -day, um, in terms of as land development has started to increase, um, I'd say it's been exponential. It hasn't been kind of just a steady climb. And the rate that we're demanded to respond, and that's driven by state statute relative to the volume of work that we have and the staff that we have, um, and not being able to have a crystal ball and predict what's going to come in the door. Um, it's been a real challenge to have enough, of, enough people there ready to go um, when all of a sudden um, we have several land division plots out there. So um, by diversifying and having other work that we can do, we're able to stay staff closer to the level that we need to be, and then as those things come up, we can float staff over to when funding comes in. Those subdevelopment you have 30 days to review those. Yes. So statutorily, but Scott's department most of the time, for the most part, gets them done in a week. And the developers obviously want them done in a day. What happens when he has to pull people to do work to be able to fund those discretionary, which subdivision plats are, well, to answer questions about those things is um, that week can turn into two weeks or three weeks or a month, the heavier the workload gets. And uh, we don't, you know, we don't want to be the slow, slow down point for increasing the development and that kind of stuff out there. So similarly to what we did in development services where we got, you know, have a 30-day uh, plan review and we set a performance measure at 20 days to try to speed up the process for people that are coming in. Scott's not essentially set that as an outcome measure, but that's the level he's performed at. He's performed at getting these things out in a week to people, or roughly a week. I mean, it, you know. and that's what they've become accustomed to. And they're probably not going to like hearing, "Well, we have 30 days, you know, and because we don't have discretionary money in our budget to fund front counter staff and people to be sitting here to do these plats, we're going to have to take longer than we've been taking because we're getting more of them." You can always say it's going to be 30 days, but if you want it in a week, you got a new price. Well, we're, we're, we're looking at that. I mean, if they want to pay the painful price, why you can get them on the Well, we might be able to do that. We're not sure if we can do that. We're, we're looking at all sorts of things. No one government, there's probably a lot of Probably. And, Scott is kind of a quiet talker, so I hope everybody was able to hear what he said. Oh, he spoke? <laughs> I do proud of him about speaking up a little bit more. I mean loud, louder. All right, Scott, thanks. Nice job. Yeah, Scott. thank you, Scott. And just no, so we you won't have that problem. Yeah, just, <laughs> just just for the record, the surveyor's office receives no general fund. I kind of said that, but yeah, I've been yeah. going general yeah. fund targets. And the uh, road fund also receives no general fund, so well, these aren't specific to budget targets you set. They're just the normal budget review. How's it going, Tom? Good. Hello. Hello. <laughs> So a couple things I'm going to just highlight with uh, John's budget that have happened since you last met, um, and then I'm going to let John hit the other highlights. Because um, I talked a little bit about the partnership he had with uh, the surveyor's office here on surveying. Um, that will be reflected in the FTE and his budget. One of the other things I really want to speak to is uh, motor pool. Um, 
we set out uh, five months ago or so to do a request for proposal on the uh, motor pool to look at outsourcing it. Um, and we had some uh, favorable pricing, although I wouldn't necessarily say an overall favorable bid, uh, because there's a lot of factors that could have uh, put us at risk of having higher costs than we have now that we couldn't tighten out. What we were able to do, though, is actually negotiate those favorable price points into an agreement with Butler Automotive. Because of that, we were able to reduce our motor pool staff by one. Uh, and we're going to look at how that works this first year. We're going to serve about half of the motor pool fleet. Uh, Butler sits out across from the sheriff's office, so we're going to start with a lot of the sheriff's cars. But we got really good pricing on servicing and then guaranteed pricing on essentially what we would call outside repairs in the past. We got them to drop their price because where we used to go to three or four different vendors, we, they agreed to drop their price if we brought the work to them. Um, the, the kind of unknowns are what are those outside repairs? Um, you know, there was in the bid packages, there were significant markups for requiring parts for outside repairs in addition to the hourly labor rate for outside repairs. So all of those things we negotiated, we think we got a pretty good position on the contract for that. We think we'll save, uh, well, we cut one FTE out of this budget, so we'll at least save the cost of that. And we think we'll even do better um, once we get it rolling. There was some hesitation, not necessarily because we're outsourcing it. And by the way, I want to say that motor pool staff transferred into an existing FTE. So we did cut the FTE but a person didn't lose their job. Um, and we try to do that whenever we try to kind of get creative about how we're doing things. Um, but we did cut an FT, and it is a position that's removed from the budget. We just had a vacancy for that person to move into somewhere else. Um, is uh, the uh, issues with the sheriff's office, for example, you know, are there going to be criminals working on my vehicles? And do I have to take out the mobile command, you know, information systems and the shotguns and all of that kind of stuff or with the county motor pool they don't have to do that so we were able to negotiate points in the contract that accounted for most of what all the concerns would be including background checks and those kinds of things it, it will require some accommodation by the departments that use it who maybe didn't have to make all of those accom accommodations previously so we were also looking at what what is the service level we're going to get but, um, pretty, uh, I think, significant change in the way that we have done business and we may move more that way or we may move back away from it once we, we get there. Um, I'm going to let John talk about the normal stuff, the pavement index and what we're spending on roads and road maintenance and not on capital projects and all that kind of stuff. But. I've done in the past, I just tried to summarize the key points uh, of the budget um, uh, on a little one pager. And um, so I'll just run through um, not every single bullet, summarize some of these, but uh, that first group I'll just run through it. The, the, bud, the budget is balanced. Task number one for, for uh, the FTE count. Uh, remains unchanged. The department uh, we did not add any FTEs and we did not cut. So we're the same size as we were last year. We've been in a period of pretty much every year we kept cutting, 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 cutting. We're down to the level that that's getting more and more difficult to do. And so the FTE count has remained unchanged for this year. But like I said, we didn't grow. Um, as we've done in the past and we're going to continue to do in the, in the foreseeable future, our priority is building this budget on, ma on maintaining what we have. Uh, we're putting the, the priority is taking care of the roads that we have and not building a bunch of new roads. Um, our revenue is adequate to maintain the current system, but it's not adequate to do a bunch of capital upgrades. So we have enough money in our budget to take care of what we got. That if, if uh, the public is looking for a bunch of new roads, that's not the position that we're in right now. Um, we're doing very well competing for grants and continue to uh, upgrade some of our roads in the grant process. State funds are leveling off and made that point in the past, and that's going to continue to be an issue for pretty much every public works department that's going to be with that across the state. And this year has no federal uh, timber revenue, uh, about a reduction of 1.1. We think we keep being told that we're going to get that last payment in, but we're going to yet to see it. Um, so we'll hold our breath. Um, 
just moving on to general general road maintenance. Basically, our service levels for this coming year should be the same as last year. Um, the one area that, that we have increased some funding is on pavement maintenance, sign replacement, and striping. Um, we have been funding those items a little higher the last couple of years than we have been in previous years. We're going to continue to do that. Um, if you remember last year, uh, we talked quite a bit about pavement condition and how we have this graph of pavement condition and we were frustrated that it, 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 it appeared that despite our best efforts to increase in funding in, in, for our pavements, increase the number of miles chip sealed, number of miles passed, the curve has kept going down. And if you remember, we were concerned that basically the software itself was part of the problem. We do have that fixed and you can see the graph here. Uh, rep represents that. We knew we had declining payment conditions and that's why we needed to invest in it. We did so and it appears now that that graph has turned around and that trend has turned and we are increasing that condition now. Um, we are going to continue to do a lot of chip seals. We're going to leave it up around 70 miles per year. Um, several years ago it was in the 30s, so we pretty much doubled um, plus some um, the number of chip seals that we're doing. We're going to continue to operate at that level. Um, uh, reserve funds for the road department. Um, we've got about $3 million in reserves um, that we're looking at going into this year. We'd like to have a little bit more. We get some of that on some capital projects that we're going to take a rock road project in, in particular is one that we dip into reserves to, uh, to try to get that done. Um, just moving on to the back side of the page, the capital construction. As I noted, our primary focus is on road maintenance, but we still do do some capital construction. We fund that primarily from funds that are not dedicated um, to, uh, or primarily dedicated towards that kind of work, like SDC's funds, the development charges, federal gas tax, we dedicate towards that program, and then what we can get in grants, plus a little better road fund. The one thing that we have been doing that I think we're probably going to have to discontinue is we've been putting about a half million dollars of the road fund into capital. And if you look at our reserve funds, they're going down. I think that's too much money. And so I think we're going to have to make further cuts in our capital program. We did do that this budget, but I think we're going to have to do that in the future. Um, because we're, putting, we're withdrawing too much out of the road funding from those capital projects for now. Um, we see the list of projects there. We do have some key projects like Trading Paper Rock Road and the Total Highway. John, could I yeah. take you back to that for yeah. a minute? So do you have any projection about the long-term impact of making that that kind of a decision of you know cutting back on the amount of capital improvement into into roads and deferring that you know out 10 years or the you know when cities do this exercise uh, to answer that kind of question it's often looked at as a capacity issue so you're going to stop building these upgrades and so your intersection will become more and more congested we have some of our facility that will become more and more congested. But the bigger issue that we're looking at is the impacts of not doing that is simply the number of roads that we have that are not built to a good standard. You've seen tape, Foothill Boulevard's been in the press a whole bunch recently because there was an accident on that. That's not built to a current county standard. By making this kind of decision, it's just going to prolong the time period that we were able to bring those roads up to a county standard. You know, we could run scenarios, but the bottom line is we, the majority of our roads aren't built to current standards, and the amount of money to bring them all up is in the billions. Yeah. And so we're taking a problem that's not going to get fixed for many, many years, and it's going to be many, many plus. It's just going to take longer to address those issues. Um, I tie on to his question. If, if money, more money, what is a prudent number for capital construction, or is there a number that you have in mind? It's such a big number. Um, I, I haven't even tried to, to, to calculate saying how much money would it take to address all of these um, narrow, windy county roads and bringing them up to a safer standard. You know, it's literally in the billions. And so I haven't tried to calculate what that would take over a 10 year or 15 or 20 year time period. But it, it would be a big number. If, if you pulled it back in a little bit and looked at some of the, you know, I mean, a certain amount of activity on the road, and you got a bad intersection or a blind spot or you had wrecks and that kind of thing, uh, would that fit in that category or would that be a cut that you'd make and then say, within this category, we should be addressing? Some number in that area. East Table Rock is an example, but it's the one you just did. 
So I mean, what we do is we build a, we do build a capital improvement program uh, approved by the board annually. And we look at those areas that are having safety issues, are having capacity issues, have the most traffic, and we try to prioritize those. And the issue is there's so many priorities out there that you cut that cut line is a very, very high cut line for your there's very, very worthy projects that need to get done that are below that cut line. The kind of criteria that you're suggesting is exactly what we're looking at. Then it's a policy issue about where you draw that line and how much money you're going to spend on it. Um, and you draw it in the areas that you think are the most critical for safety capacity, um, that it could be drawn higher or lower to the amount of how much money they have done. I was just going to say foothills would be another good example. I mean, just the cost to review foothills. And you might talk about our partnerships with the city metro and the city metro and stuff. And, and then the whole thing was that they do a good job of taking uh, money and leveraging it against uh, stiff funds and, and, uh, and uh, uh, capital air improvement uh, you know, academic statement at the moment. So that's the only way to close your lane, I mean, those kind of things. We cannot afford just going to do by ourselves. Yeah. And so we take a little bit of money and, and leverage that through Absolutely. partnerships uh, that, that turns on some fairly decent sized projects. It, it does. I'll just <coughs> key on what Danny said. So tag on that. The way we try to approach these capital projects is instead of running around doing the intersection here, doing the intersection there, identify some corridors in the valley that need the most attention. Try to go after grants, partnerships, or whatever we can to address those corridors. And so right now our, our priority has been Tabor Off Road. We're putting most of our project money into Tabor Off Road and upgrading that facility. So very, very high volume uh, north-south arterial in the valley that's very busy. That's getting close to getting into shape with some recent grants that we got to put Tabor Off Road's in pretty good shape for the next 15 years. The next priority we're moving to is in Foothill Boulevard. And to give you an indication that the section of Foothill Boulevard inside the city limits, so Barnett to, to, to Delta Waters, that section there, it's estimated to be in the neighborhood of $80 million to bring that up to a standard that's, that's adequate for the city to take the road over and handle the traffic. And if you know, $80 million, that's just, that, that's just that's a pipe. You know, it's going to be a long time before we can do that. So we're going to chunk out a little piece here and chunk out and just keep working on it. But it's going to be a long time before we get football in a condition that's acceptable, frankly. Did, for everybody here, I don't know, I think Dick was the only one here then, but with the previous board, Dick served on a committee to actually look at capital improvements in the road fund. And they actually were trying to earmark a certain amount each year that would work. If I remember you were hoping just for even $10 million a year or something like that. Yeah. It was a, a pretty small number, and how much could we get done over 20 years with $10 million a year? So I think that's why he was asking the questions. But everyone else, I don't think, has that perspective that you had from working on that, Dick. And um, you know, one of the things that hurt us was the loss of the, the ONC money. Not this year, but when we used to receive four million a year, that's a lot of money that was going to match other projects and could also, you know, in this case, would go towards or could go towards capital or building that reserve in capital. And that's all the big on. So it, it's even worse than when you did that then, um, and that's a lot of money to lose every year. And the other thing I would add is that the, with the inflation of construction materials and completing projects and the flat revenues, the city of Medford and the state of ODOT, pretty much everybody is slashing the capitalists. Everybody's going to come over and just basically be taking care of what you got. And the, the days of, old, of massive construction, it's it's, I'm not going to say it's behind this because things change, but boy, the picture of most public works agencies has changed very much over the last five to ten years. Well, it's interesting to hear the politicians yelling, shovel ready jobs. <laughs> you know, we'll do that, we've got all these things we need to do, and nothing will filter us down. I mean, we got shovel ready jobs. Filters down, but you just got to go to another country to get the work. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I'm confused. Yeah. Well, that we don't have. I mean, what you're saying, we have billions of dollars for things that could be improved in just this county. We do, and if somebody has some shovel-ready money, I got the shovel ready job for you. <laughs> what I well, do. i got to tell you, <laughs> but, I mean, to put some reality to that, the shovel-ready, seriously, there was some funding that was available that was designed to go to another project. The other project didn't quite pan out right. 
ODOT called John and said, we have this amount of money. We understand you have a project that is ready to go. It was John and his both staff that did the engineering and everything. We got the money yep. to do it. Yep. And I mean, if we had not have had that, that had not been shovel ready, yep. and gone someplace else. Yes, so, you. so, you know, there's some, some pragmatic things that are going on and with the cross fingers. So, yep. so. so you always got to have some shovel ready on the shelf, right? You want to have some projects that you don't want to do all the design and environmental work <coughs> because it, it sits for five years, you got to redo it. But you want to be far enough along and that it's that an opportunity comes along. You all part of the money you get it and go. Yeah. Well, in the back of my mind, and I'm probably not practical, but you know, at some point we we have some money left in the budget and you have decisions. You want to spend it on this or that or this. But if you had a matching fund where you needed five million dollars and you could attract fifty million dollars to really solve a real critical road issue. I think you are right, it is wishful thinking. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it ought to be in the plot to think about. Sure. I mean, should, 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 well, that's where you're using something. Yeah, I mean, it, it ought to be. I'm going to move us along because we need them to cover the parks. Right. Still. So I'll just uh, I'll touch on parks real quick. Um, the, the financially, the park stability of the parks program continues to increase. You know, the business plan we developed a few years ago of trying to take some of these concession contracts where we were paying somebody else to operate the park and then to walk away with the profits, where we took those, some of those back in-house, has really paid off. And our parks program is the most financially stable it's been in a long time. Um, I, I appreciate the board's courage to take back, allow us to take back some of those concession contracts because there's, there's some debate on that, but it's really proven to be beneficial for our parks program. Um, uh, we did, um, we were successful with Senate Bill 1514 that was just passed, where the budget committee might not be aware of it. We're going to get about 160, about 135 thousand dollars more per year, um, sharing the RV registration fees. You bought your RV and paid your annual registration fee. All that money went to the state, and the county's got a small piece of that. And the counties were able to successfully lobby and get a big chunk of that by the county. You know, we had half the campsites. We thought that was only fair. Um, we don't have any general fund support this year. Um, this is the sixth year we're pretty used to living without it. You know, we'll throw some our way. We'll find a really good use for it. We don't expect it. Um, <coughs> and kick me underneath the table. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, we've we've done it at times because it's it's return on investment in generating revenue, kind of like Dick was mentioning earlier. And we're looking at doing a couple projects right now that could do the same. Yeah. 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 I remember the state was talking about possibly doing park swaps. I mean, that was part of the 1536 concept. Is there anything here in Jackson County that is that being considered in some of those areas? Or you know, the, 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 sure for that? the state had a list of parks that they wanted to, and I think, I'm, be frank, they wanted to unload yeah. because they're not revenue producing and they're paying. And so they were looking at the counties at, at getting rid of these. Um, we've had some conversations with state parks. There doesn't appear to be anything here that they really are interested in getting rid of. And and taking, you know, on the, on the road side, there's always, it's easy to point to a few roads and say that really ought to be a state highway and that ought to be a county facility. We've done that with the parks and just didn't find a lot of opportunities. We would love to take Valley to State yeah. Park. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. yeah. just trying to figure out how to do it. But I don't think the state's role is excited to that the way. I'll just summarize in the parks program, our levels of service should remain uh, the, the same as last year. The, the big issue that we're facing in parks is there's just no water in this course. And so that's going to have a direct impact on our parks budget. We budgeted accordingly. We, we projected reduced revenues pretty much across the board at all of our lake parks because we just expected to get back here. And the, the budget still was balanced even with projected more revenues. But uh, other than that, other than all the service levels should remain the same. So maybe a sweet resort deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like yeah. something that would make it a good, a good deal, too. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Yeah. Yeah. Any yeah. questions for John? You know, I just make a comment. Just a good news story here. I, I can remember when I first came on the budget committee, we always had a pretty sizable deficit in the parks. Hardly nothing was in the And every year, Oh, we can't do anything about it. Yeah, it's just 
interest in it is it was two million. Yeah, and if you want to close the parks, we can close them, and it was that kind of an attitude. And to come around this way now, all the parks are open, the better neighborhood, were, and you're breaking it even, and you're able to fund cultural projects along the way. That just got to be. Hey, we want to know, or we got noticed by the Oregonian for having the, the was it Howard Carter? It was Howard Carter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Howard Carter. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We get it out there, Dick. It's mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, just keep it up. You have to read the paper, mm -hmm. though, Dick. It's a good story. It needs to be repeated. It's, it's really been, uh, you know, Steve Lambert's not here today, but he's the parks manager. Bringing him on was very helpful. And then it's really just being a lot more business minded about the way we run the parks. Yeah. Any other questions for me? Thanks, you guys. Jay, did you want to say anything? Because you, you came shirt and tie. <laughs> <laughs> you doing really well. Okay. 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 I also like your support. Yeah, I've got my job. All right, okay. All right you guys. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks. Wait for John to look at me and say, look in that book and find the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll see tomorrow at 1.30.